We're taking a look here of how to be successful in one's study of Torah. It's stated in the Talmud, Megillah 6 Beam, If a man says to you, I have labored in the study of Torah, I have not succeeded, do not believe him. If he says, I have not labored, but have succeeded, do not believe him either. If he says, I have labored and succeeded, you may believe him. The Gemara concludes that this is true in respect of sharpening one's understanding, but remembering what one has learned all depends on assistance of heaven. Mothers, we need divine grace and understanding on this. The upshot is that man is guaranteed success if he would but learn. As the Me'iri comments on the passage, man must always make an effort to study Torah. He should not refrain from doing so with the excuse that he is not ready, because it is well known that if he tries, he will succeed. It would appear that in the Gemara, passage contradicts the passage in Nidas 70b. What must a man do that he may become wise? Let him engage in much study and a little business. But didn't many do so and not succeed? Rather, let him pray for mercy from him to whom is the wisdom. For it is said in Proverbs 2, six, For Hashem gives wisdom, and out of his mouth comes knowledge and discernment. We see that one does not obtain wisdom from effort alone. To reconcile the above contradiction, we must distinguish between the terms become wise and sharpen one's understanding. The first implies something on a much higher level, for it results in a person being called wise. Not everyone attains this, this because it is not in his hands, but in God's. Sharpening is one understanding. Uh, understanding, however, meets, uh, merely implies comprehending something. This is possible through one's effort, and that is why the Gemara's passage in Megillah guarantees it for the one who has labored. Based on this, it would be safe to assume that anyone who studies in a yeshiva or in a school or a kollel diligently will succeed in his studies, without exception. Unfortunately, however, this is not true. Uh, many yeshiva students perform below their abilities. This is the reason why it's so especially in the light of the Gemara's assertion. Why is this in, in, uh, especially true in the light of the Gemara's assertion? Clearly, the Gemara promises applies only to whoever exerts appropriate effort to learning Torah in a correct way. Sadly, the, uh, the, the adversary has penetrated our primary and secondary uh, yeshivot, where he has convinced our students that they already understand, they already know, before they even have already delved into their studies. This results in a lack of effort even to properly comprehend the subject plain meaning. This is especially prevalent among the most gifted students. This causes the students to blunder by examining only the tip of the iceberg without realizing that their knowledge is only superficial. And because they believe themselves to be so smart, it is most difficult to set them straight. This is now the case of a lot of rabbis who, who are very intelligent, but at the same time not very wise. It is therefore urgent that the instructor, instructors in the yeshivots and the lower levels of Masiftos concentrate mainly on enabling their students to study and understand the main text literally in literal interpretation and not engage in dialectics, albeit with good intentions of sharpening their students' minds and whetting their schol scholaristic or scholastic appetites. Another drawback of, to this method of teaching youngsters whose mental capabilities are not yet sufficiently developed is that they will not be impressed when hearing similar styled lectures at high institutions in the future years. Many young men have achieved below their ability while spending the years of prime in advance as vote because they have never received adequate training in how to properly study a page in the Gemara. To study to such students, the adage goes, I have labored and have not succeeded. Does not apply since they have never truly labored in a way that might result in success in their studies. And it is regretful that hundreds of students have lost so much time because of lack of proper guidance to their developing years. Sadly, this situation continues into their kolel years. This is also very tragic, disgraceful to the Torah, to the scriptures. However, one might rectify the situation. How? There exists no framework with, uh, within the advanced yeshiva or school of learning for lessons in plain meaning of the subject matter. Besides, who, who would attend such a class? It's only recourse for a student also requires him for him to set aside um, some of the time to study privately with a scholar educator who can set him right. And those are hard to come by. This is why it talks about in the in, in, to acquire a teacher. 
from the time of the Talmud until now, the period of the Rishonim, the 11th century, people respected the prohibition of utilizing Torah to make a living. Now it's become very popular. So we find that the Tanaims and the Marims earned the livelihood through other means, as did, Rabbi, as did Hillel, Rabbi Yochanan, the shoemaker, Rabbi Yehoshua, the, the, coal, the charcoal burner, and Abba Hikiya, the daily plowman. Rambam, too, strongly discouraged accepting charity to support one's Torah studies. Talmud Torah 3.10. However, Kesef Mishnah states that it is permitted where one has no other source of income to receive a stipend from his students or their parents or from the community. He concludes, we have seen that all the sages of Israel, both before and after our master Rambam, have been paid by the community, though we, we, we accept the Rambam's ruling, perhaps that the sages' behavior is due to what it says in Psalms 119, verse 126, it's time to act for Hashem. They voided your Torah. For if the teachers and the students of the Torah had no means of support, they would be unable to concentrate on their respective tasks, with the results of Torah would be soon forgotten. With the necessary financial backing, the study of the Torah and its proliferations are made possible. This is why it's very important to support Torah proliferation and Torah study. In practice, then, we see that it is entirely permissible for Torah scholars to be supported by the community or even um, the donations of people who wish to learn Torah. It is even proper to do so in order to preserve the Torah. Nowadays, it is even more praiseworthy for a young, a young newlywed scholar to continue his Torah studies for several years in the company of similar colleagues because of the threat of spiritual values which lurk beyond, beyond the walls of the study halls. Indeed, the custom has become so widespread that in religious communities, as you'll see in Be'ur Halacha or Achaim 238, despite the, the above, Mentioned, I just mentioned, it is still appropriate to investigate how far one must go in trusting in God to provide him with a livelihood so that he might freely study Torah to serve him without making any effort to make a, li a living on his own. Thank God nowadays, young scholars, by, uh, young scholars by providing all or at least some of their financial needs is, com is done. In general, it's possible to make ends meet by joining two or three kolims. In other words, evening or weekend studies, or with the help of, of, of one's family or working wife. Some individuals even have the privilege of enjoying two tables, berachot, five beam, in learning and, and wealth, by being supported by their parents or their in-laws. But our sages have warned that not everyone merits this. Hence, one must check whether an intended rich bride will properly value the continuation of her husband's studying, even if she attends... A seminary, for there are very few women like Rabbi Kiva's wife, very few, Rachel. However, when it is po impossible to obtain enough support through Kolelim, the young scholar is faced with the question of working for a living, for if he sits idly, perhaps he would transgress what it says in Devarim 6.16, do not try Hashem your God. Alternatively, perhaps Torah study is different, it's permissible to cast your burden upon God and trust in Him and somehow provide sustenance. Of course, it is proper to dedicate oneself to Torah study as long as one is able to, to live frugally and even even in poverty, as our sages said. In Perkei Avot 6.4, if you eat bread with salt, live a life of deprivation and toil in Torah, you are praiseworthy and all is well with you. However, this is a conditional upon one's learning diligently and being satisfied with his lot. He must not complain about not receiving assistance from others and, of course, against God. This way of life must also not interfere with his domestic harmony. In other words, the family in the home is called Shalom Bayit. We must realize that this is a common for God to test the resolve of Torah scholars. Whoever withstands these tests may eventually merit, as it says in Shabbat 104a, if one comes to cleanse himself, he is helped. There is a good support for exclusive reliance on God by one who trusts strongly in him and who devotes himself totally, totally to Torah and God's service. This support is found within well-known words of the Rambam and Shemitah of Yovel 1313. Any person, even if it's not a Kohen or Levi, in the world who becomes inspired and decides to dedicate himself to serving God and knowing Him and relieving himself from all other worldly pursuits, becomes sanctified and merits to have God as his portion and inheritance forever. God will provide his sustenance in this world as he does for the Kohanim and the Levim. Through the Rambam, although, although though the Rambam did not specifically mention the study of Torah, 
it, is, it may be inferred from his statements in chapter 13, verse 12, that the Levite's task was to teach his correct ways and just judgment, as is written in Devarim 33.10. And they shall teach your laws to Yaakov and your instructions to Israel. Obviously, one cannot teach without first learning. And therefore, the Rambam concludes, and not only the Levim, but any person. Ridbaz states that God will provide such a person with a source of income so that he need not to rely on the community charity. The above also applied, however, not only to earlier generations, but also nowadays it becomes permissible to be supported by the community as Rambam's assurance could certainly apply to one's finding someone to support him in his studies. Yet the Rambam set some strict conditions. Who becomes inspired decides after a mental struggle to dedicate himself to serve God in knowing them or knowing him. Today, in, in common for all young scholars to study in a kolal or a place of learning, in the inspiration conviction may be lacking, not to mention dedication to serving God and knowing him. Nevertheless, there is some similarity, uh, and whoever feels that the Rambam's condition applies to him is guaranteed a source of li a livelihood. We're going to take a look at, uh, in our next video, a little bit more about this, and so I see you uh, in our next video. Shalom, shalom.